Finance and Economics from the University of Oxford and a Master's in International Political Economy from the London School um, of Economics. Welcome, Dishal. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you to our audience for joining us today as well. Um, the topic of today's discussion is Sri Lanka, economic crisis, fact or fiction. Um, to start off today's discussion, we would like to pose a somewhat broad uh, question to you, Vishal. Um, so yesterday, the central bank presented their roadmap, um, a six month roadmap for ensuring macroeconomic and financial sector stability. What is your initial prognosis of this document uh, and the kind of impact that you think it can have on the economy going forward? Yeah, uh, thanks, Nakia. So uh, first of all, thanks to Advocata for uh, inviting me to speak today. It's a, it's a pleasure. Um, yeah, so the roadmap was uh, much looked at, uh, was uh, much, much looked forward to by, by markets to get some sense of direction, um, given the recent changes that we had seen in the central bank um, and in some uh, critical government economic uh, decision making. Um, in terms of the, the contents of the, uh, the roadmap, I think a lot of the material that was uh, was presented um, was already uh, had already been signaled uh, previously um, in the markets in terms of uh, the overall approach towards um, reserve management, the overall approach towards um, debt management. Many of the the key the the big ticket issues there had uh, had already previously been in the works, right? So, for example, if you look at um, the government's efforts in terms of um, obtaining government to government bilateral uh, loans and other financial instruments, uh, swaps between the central bank and other uh, other monetary institutions uh, globally, uh, many of these had already been uh, had already been uh, previously in the in the discourse of the central bank as well. What was new, there were a few different new areas that were uh, touched on as well. One of them, of course, was the, the, the initial signaling um, that the central bank is willing to uh, or considering would consider buying back um, sovereign, uh, international sovereign bonds if the, if the market would, um, would be conducive for it. <clears throat> this is something that had not really been uh, uh, mentioned before. Um, and I think there was some initial positive uh, movement on the near term Sri Lankan sovereign bonds uh, in response to that. Uh, the challenge with this objective is, of course, typically when <clears throat> the issuer starts to uh, starts to indicate buying uh, buying back bonds, taking advantage of a discount. Typically, those price margins start shrinking, right? So the discount starts to shrink, and I think we've already seen that on the 2022 uh, January issuance um, as well. And of course, with any uh, like in terms of repaying bonds in uh, repaying uh, or settling sovereign bonds in general, uh, the government does have to have the reserves to be able to uh, to do so. Uh, so the market would take into account those um, those factors as well. The other somewhat new um, approach was the the, uh, the crystallization of the government's intention of converting some of the uh, dollar deposits of uh, export uh, export and corporate uh, sector in particular uh, into rupees um, and that they said that over a six month period that they would be looking to do uh, these conversions um, the figure quoted was around in the range of two billion dollars um, and that is something that, that had been again mentioned uh, in, in passing in, in the last couple of weeks uh, but this was the first time that this was outlined in the you know in official uh, policy statements that was again a somewhat new uh, new measure and also the mention of the the rollover of some of the Sri Lanka development bonds. Um, <clears throat> here again, the challenge is that a lot of Sri Lanka, so SLDBs are largely held by commercial banks in the country. Um, so, and a lot of Sri Lankan banks have um, uh, negative net foreign asset positions, right? So they will need the cash flows from SLDBs to be able to settle some of their liabilities as well. So it may not be as straightforward to, uh, to roll over com comprehensively some of the SLDB uh, issues that are coming out. So in sum, I would say that uh, the, the roadmap kind of um, uh, confirmed some of the measures that the government has been looking at in terms of debt management, uh, particularly the, um, the the path that they've decided to take without seeking um, uh, seeking uh, an IMF program uh, and without uh, looking at uh, that uh, that mode, but to con continue to, um, to uh, seek uh, an alternative uh, mechanism of settling uh, external debt uh, liabilities and uh, managing the economy through homegrown uh, solutions. So um, overall, that was how I saw the, uh, the the roadmap and the kind of path that it uh, Mac hopes to chart out over the next six months. Deshal, if we were to dip, uh, dig a dip, uh, deeper in, into the implications of yesterday's event, uh, 
you know, I, I let me quote uh, the governor himself who said, uh, I can assure you that the criticism that Sri Lanka will be facing difficulties is misplaced. We have shown that the situation can be managed and it will be done so in the next few years. These were his, these were his words. They shall, is he being too optimistic or are we not really, you know, in, in, are we not really experiencing the kind of crisis that most of us have been talking about? So look, I mean, as a as a key policymaker, the gov the central bank governor and the central bank in general has to take a positive approach, right? You can't have a uh, you can't uh, you can't go into a, a, a challenge with a uh, with a negative attitude, thinking that you're going to fail. So you do have to have um, a positive approach, and you do have to uh, be to take the view that this can be solved and that that we will solve it. And I think that not just the government, I think all all stakeholders have to take a, a similar view. Otherwise, it it can become self fulfilling. Um, what, what is what is needed is um, is a, a concrete a concrete plan in terms of uh, addressing some of those key issues, right? So the central bank has laid out some of their thoughts in terms of what uh, what can be done. And I think if you look at the key issue here, um, the critical issue is in, in terms of debt management, the ability for Sri Lanka to uh, to meet its external uh, debt uh, maturing debt liabilities in the coming um, five years. Now, towards that end, I would, in in my opinion, the uh, the the critical the critical lever is going to be uh, how Sri Lanka can regain access to global capital markets, um, and the the path to that is so. Typically, you would have three countries, middle income countries like Sri Lanka, that do have um, um, uh, large maturities of external debt. Uh, what typically middle middle income countries do would be to raise um, raise capital from global uh, global financial markets, global bond markets. Uh, refinance the capital portion of uh, of the maturing debt, service the interest, uh, and then keep on and uh, keep uh, keep going in that uh, in that manner. Um, the fact that we have Sri Lanka has lost access to global capital markets and has been unable to raise uh, offshore financing is really one of the biggest constraints that we have uh, in today's context, um, and that is a critical issue that uh, that we need to solve. Now, in the roadmap, there was mention of the fact that Sri Lanka needs to raise its credit rating, and Raising, raising the credit rating is certainly, I would say, the again a key uh, a key milestone in that process because right now we are at uh, a level of a credit rating of triple C, um, and at that credit rating you cannot you simply don't have the um, the wherewithal to be able to raise uh, the material required amounts of uh, cash in global in, in global markets, right? So our first step has to be to raise our credit rating back up to a B level and then keep improving it from there. Um, and then regain access to global uh, capital markets, refinance our debts, uh, and in, the, in parallel, then what we need to do is to uh, to gradually reduce our uh, our budget deficits. That will reduce the requirements for external borrowing as well, um, and that would be the path that I would think that Sri Lanka needs to spell out in terms of how we get out of this crisis. Now, even though the uh, the the roadmap had said specifically the requirement of raising our improving our credit ratings. Um, there wasn't a lot more specificity around exactly how we tackle that particular objective. And I think the markets, global markets in particular, would be looking for a little bit more clarity in terms of how Sri Lanka seeks to do that. And I think that is something that we still uh, we still need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Dasha. And to kind of uh, um, dig a little deeper on that aspect that you spoke about, um, some economists are saying that what we are, what we have, is uh, solvency or a debt crisis. Um, uh, but but uh, the government has seen to say that it's like fundamentally a dollar liquidity crisis. They um, say if you get enough inflows coming in, that it won't be too much of an issue. Um, and and the entire strategy is kind of based on that. To my understanding, is is there some truth to their understanding? Like what what is your opinion on on solvency versus the liquidity problem that we're facing? Yeah, so it's a, it's a little bit tricky in terms of defining what is solvency versus what is a liquidity problem for a, a for a sovereign, right? For a company, it's quite straightforward. You look at your net assets and you, you look at your your short term assets or short term liabilities. <clears throat> you can very easily see if there's a solvency problem. Um, for a sovereign, that's it's not the case. So there is no kind of objective criteria to define what is solvent and what is insolvent. Now, Sri Lanka has had the, the debt issues that Sri Lanka has had, external debt uh, buildup that Sri Lanka has had, is not a new phenomenon. It's not something that uh, that emerged in the last two years. Right? Sri Lanka has had, in 2000, end of 2019, we had 86% debt to GDP. We had uh, significant dollar uh, repayments at that time as well. 
the difference though was the the critical issue in terms of access to global capital markets um and the fact that we have lost access to global capital markets in early 2020 um <clears throat> that is really where the liquidity crunch has become has kind of superseded or become the critical issue that uh, that sri lanka faces right now um institutions like the imf for instance would have uh, what you call a debt sustainability analysis a dsa um where they would they would have a particular figure in terms of debt to gdp um, which would be considered to be sustainable or not, <clears throat> but again, all this can be all this is uh, is up for up for debate and up for negotiation, right? So I I would be hesitant to kind of classify something a problem as a, a solvency crisis versus a liquidity crisis when when we are when we are particularly discussing uh, a sovereign. But I think what is abundantly clear and what everybody agrees on is that we do have a substantial liquidity crisis, um, and uh, the the still the path to address that. Is some is the the kind of the, the sustainable way out of that is to regain access to global capital markets. I think where the debate between say um, so, some economists uh, and the, and the government is that the government has been looking at instruments such as uh, such as swaps, which are typically short term uh, instruments in terms of addressing liquidity. Um, whereas actually Sri Lanka would need to be able to raise longer term capital as well. Um, so typically, instruments like international sovereign bonds, they have a, a longer tenor of, uh, of five years to 10 years, uh, which gives a little bit more leeway in terms of managing uh, managing your liquidity and managing your external uh, external cash flows. Um, so I think that is the kind of the the more um, the more uh, the more subtle debate that is uh, that is out there and where that disagreement still lies. Uh, I would still be hesitant to to kind of debate solvency versus liquidity when it comes to a sovereign. Desha, uh, I believe uh, a significant, I mean, a key, a key, a key strategy uh, in the in this particular roadmap was in capturing uh, export dollars. I think that was a significant uh, attention and focus mm -hmm. on this. Now, uh, now, don't these dollars come into uh, private private hands, or you know, is don't these dollars are these are these still with the exporters? I mean, how 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 does the whole process work of getting it towards the treasury, uh, and and is there a way of capturing these dollars and making use of it uh, for for debt payments or to increase uh, government uh, stocks of dollars? Is there is there any pro is there any process of that sort? Yeah, so so this is quite somewhat new to Sri Lanka, to my to my knowledge. Um, so I think what the what the government is looking at is so that typically if you have an exporter. Who earns in dollars, they would uh, bring back dollars to the Sri Lankan economy. Uh, and when, for whatever payments that they have in rupees, so for example, if you take an apparel exporter, um, the exporter would receive the income, its revenues in, in dollars largely, uh, but it has to pay its salaries in rupees, it has to pay its uh, electricity bill in rupees, it has to pay its transport bill in rupees. So all of those rupee payments, uh, for those, it would convert dollars into rupees. And, and that transaction would happen in the banking system. Um, or, uh, or with the with the central bank, but typically with the with the banking system. So that what happens there is the dollars that come in from commercial transactions from Sri Lankan exporters gets circulated into uh, into the uh, into the Sri Lankan banking system. Um, so what the what the government has been uh, has been arguing is that um, of these dollar uh, inflows that have been coming in, um, insufficient amounts have been converted uh, into rupees, and thereby insufficient dollars are being uh, uh, are being brought into the banking system. Now, it, there is it's it's very difficult to say what is a sufficient level of dollars or what is not, right? So that that is that's typically up to the um, up to the uh, the private export as you uh, as you alluded to as you alluded to as well. Um, the, the central bank even previously has had minimum levels of conversions that um, uh, that have been mandated, uh, but what they're saying now is that look that the, the levels that have been converted are, are are not sufficient and do not reflect the actual inflows that have come in and what is what has been come in has been now been placed as uh, as dollar deposits. So what they're asking is for um, private entities to convert those dollars into rupees with the banking system and thereby make those dollars available for the general um, uh, for general transactions in terms of payments of for imports payments for other uh, dollar liabilities um, so I, I would think that the government what the government is saying is that look, this is is a temporary measure given the situation that we have with the pandemic given the fact that critical inflows like tourism have been um, have been disrupted uh, I would think that it's a temporary measure which would not be a, a, a longer term a long-term issue 
Uh, however, the signal that it does give the market is quite uh, would be quite concerned, right? Because anybody who is um, uh, exporting in um, uh, exporting and earning in dollars would want to have uh, those dollar earnings because a lot of the exporters also have uh, dollar payments to make as well in terms of their uh, their um, their inputs. Again, we take the apparel example. A lot of the imported the, the inputs for the apparel sector, such as textiles uh, and accessories, they are imported and they are they require uh, dollars as well. Um, so it's a it's it's an unusual situation for the government to re, to uh, to require a large level of conversions um, of dollars into rupees of this uh, of this nature, um, and the signal, as I said, it does it is not a it's not a very uh, very positive signal because it does it will really concern future exporters as well, and it may may make future exporters or future other in, uh, potential inflows uh, more concerned or more weary about uh, bringing uh, bringing cash back into uh, into the dollars back into the economy. Um, but it is, I would expect it to be a temporary measure, uh, and that communication, I think, would be quite critical as well to make sure that there are no longer-term adverse implications from a signaling perspective of this measure that has been uh, has been put forward. Um, just to kind of piggyback on the um, earlier question, um, one of the questions that we've gotten is if there's any truth to the argument that purchasing. Um, dollars belonging to the exporters will kind of further increase the, the liquidity of money in, in circulation in the markets. People believe that when the central bank of Sri Lanka buys dollars, they have to buy these dollars by issuing more rupees into the market through the issuance of new instruments. Um, is If this is true, if, if you could kindly explain that to, to our audience, the kind of process. So that should... Okay, so that would be a, the, a, a secondary step, right? So the first step would be the exporter would sell their dollars to the banking system, to any of the commercial banks in the country, and uh, take rupees in in exchange for that. Now the central bank in turn can buy uh, can buy dollars from um, from the banking system, uh, and for that then they would exchange it with rupees, and that would increase rupee liquidity um, in the market. So that also the central bank has been doing. The central bank has been uh, buying uh, both remittance proceeds of remittances and proceeds of exports from the uh, from the banking system, and for in, uh, in exchange for that, they provide rupee, rupee liquidity uh, into the banking system as well. Uh, so that is one of the factors that has uh, that has resulted in higher rupee liquidity uh, in the banking sector over the last uh, over the last several months. Uh they shall, I think, still dwelling on the whole exchange rate issue because this is where I think a lot of people have a lot of questions on this front. Uh, something that 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 I think a lot of people are interested in knowing is also on the long-term implications of uh, the foreign exchange crisis. Uh, what would you say is the long-term impact, and how is it going to affect uh, future investment uh, and and the investment decisions of our local entrepreneurs, exporters? Uh, so, if you could just answer that. Yeah, sure. So, uh, so look, I think first of all, it's we need to again contextualize the foreign exchange crisis or the, the foreign exchange challenges that we face right now, right? Um, so, uh, Sri Lanka has had constraints in terms of its external sector uh, for a while. We run consistent current account uh, deficits. We have, in recent years, had large uh, external payments, um, uh, external li debt, li debt liabilities as well. Uh, so, if we Put that numerically we over the next five years we have approximately four to five billion dollars worth of debt repayments per year you add to that a typical current account deficit of two to two and a half million dollars a year as well so our net the government fin dollar financing requirement is in the range of seven billion dollars each year and that's a substantial amount right um so when you couple those known outflows with the fact that we have we lack access to global capital markets that is really where uh, that is really where we see reserves then shrinking and then putting the creating the kind of pressures that we are seeing in the, uh, in, the in the current in the in the forex market in general. Now, in, on on top of our those structural issues, what we've seen with the pandemic is that our some of our key uh, sources of inflows have been uh, disrupted as well. Right, so the tourism sector would typically bring in on a gross basis around 4.3 billion dollars to the external sector. Uh, if we take if you consider also the uh, the outflows on tourism with Sri Lanka is traveling abroad. That's typically around 1.5, 1.6 billion dollars. So on net basis, you're looking at about 2.7 billion dollars in flows on uh, from from the tourism sector, right? So that sector is pretty much out of the equation. So that has made a, a challenging situation worse, right? So a lot of people think that look, when tourism comes back in, everything will be okay. We'll be fine with the additional four billion dollars. We can settle our debts. Uh, I, I think that is probably an, an overly optimistic view. 
uh, the tourism when tourism gets back in full gear, it certainly helps in terms of mitigating or reducing the kind of the, the pressures on the external sector, but it doesn't solve our problems entirely. We can either it can help us in terms of some of our external debt repayments, or it can help us in terms of reducing the import restrictions that we have. But it certainly can't address both those problems. To address both those problems, we need again we need to go back to uh, you know, we need to regain access to global capital markets for which we need to upgrade our uh, credit ratings. Right. So, uh, given that context and the fact that the global the pandemic has also played a role in this um, in the in the current forex situation is something that the that investors and that the market will uh, will keep in mind as well. Um, what would uh, what would concern markets to to some extent is that when we have situations where uh, we have prolonged um, um, disruptions in access to uh, to raw material inputs to be able to import uh, intermediate um, imports for the production process. Um, that certainly is something that would create uh, concerns for investors in, in the longer term, right? So uh, there again, that is why typically for the investment decision, the macroeconomic stability of a, of a country is a, um, critical, a critical input. Um, uh, so, so that I think is something that that they could, that um, the market would uh, would keep would be concerned about, uh, and would would could have potentially longer term uh, longer term implications. Now, um, in order to uh, to address that, I think again one of the factors that is uh, that would concern uh, would concern markets is uh, is the fact that we have um, uh, we have a, a, a significant divergence between the official exchange rate and uh, and informal exchange rates. Um, and that again is one of the factors that has contributed to um, the, to some exporters and further inflows not coming in um, in a uh, in a substantive manner. There have been delays in terms of uh, some of these conversions, um, and that again is a is a is a policy choice, right? So uh, those kind of decisions will certainly have uh, would have um, uh, would create some uh, concerns for the market for investors in general, um, and that would have to be addressed in order to prevent any kind of longer term. Uh, longer term adverse implications coming from that. Thank you for the very um, insightful um, answer. Just, I'm sorry to interrupt the flow, um, but just to summarize uh, what we've been uh, kind of talking about to everybody who's joined in recently. Um, so, we've so far discussed um, a wide uh, variety of the macroeconomic situation that we are currently uh, drawing questions on. Uh, we touched upon um, yesterday's discussion, the central bank discussion uh, with the central bank governor, um, and um, the child highlighted how it's um, kind of very difficult to kind of really say if we have a solvency versus a liquidity crisis, especially when it comes to um, a sovereign, that kind of uh, difficulty in categorizing it as either or kind of situation. We spoke about um, the importance of getting access to international financial markets, especially um, with Sri Lanka being downgraded uh, consistently over the period of time. And we have a few questions, I believe, on the chat box regarding that, which we will also take up in further detail. Um, we have, uh, again, reminded the audience to kindly put in your questions, and we will read them out throughout the discussion. Um, to kind of... Uh Sorry, Yeah, uh, I think as, as Nakia highlighted, uh, Deshal spoke uh, extensively on a few areas. Uh, just a few, uh, you know, if we, if we were to summarize a bit more, I think he spoke on uh, on on, Dele, on on the dollar crisis and 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 you know explain how the current crisis is, is unexcept uh, is is an unusual situation and he elaborated a few uh, policy solutions. Uh, Nakia, shall we jump on to uh, a, few, a few questions that we have received from the audience, and you know, make uh, and 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 get going on that front? Yeah, sure, definitely, Manga. Uh, just before that, um, I'd like to remind the audience that the discussion will be available on the social media pages after the discussion. Um, so, if you have missed uh, anything that we have discussed so far, you can uh, refer back to it after the discussion is over. Um, so to address some questions, Bashar, that we've been getting in uh, on the on the chat box, um, we have a question on on ISBs. So the question reads: Can we buy the ISBs we issued as per the roadmap? Um, is there a clause in ISBs that the issuer cannot buy it back? Sorry, Nakia, you broke up a little bit. There, could you repeat that? Of course. Um, so the question reads: Can we buy the ISBs we issued as per the roadmap? 
or is there like a clause in um, ISPs that the issuer cannot hmm. buy it back? Um, I'm not aware of any clauses that uh, that prevent the issuer from uh, from buying it back. And buying buying back um, debt issued by the issuer is not a is not a atypical. It's not an uncommon thing. Um, typically, uh, what would happen is that um, uh, when there is a substantial discount in the in the pricing, then that is that is at the point at which the issuer would look at uh, look at uh, buying back. Right. So, if you take an example of the January 2022 bond. Um, that is uh, last week. It was trading at about uh, 90 cents to the dollar, so that's about a 10% uh, discount. Uh, it's a 500 million dollar bond. So if the government of Sri Lanka is able to buy back the entire bond, they can buy it back at 450 million dollars and save 50 million dollars uh, instead of paying the entire amount in uh, in Jan 22. So that's the kind of <clears throat> that's the idea behind it. Um, typically, what happens is once the issuer signals that it is going to buy buy back or it starts buying back, then that, that discount starts to shrink, right? So the benefit of uh, of doing, of making that transaction then um, then declines as well, particularly if the market still believe that uh, the issuer can settle the bond in full uh, at the time it is it is actually maturing. Um, and I think that is probably what will happen to the January 22 um, uh, bond payment. Um, it becomes more challenging when it comes to the July 22 bond payment because uh, Sri Lanka's reserve position uh, right now is about 3.5 billion dollars as it end August. Uh, there are some substantial outflows in uh, in September as well. So we'd like to see some uh, the decline in the reserve position in um, at the end of September. Um, and given the the out known outflows that are occurring also in Q1 2022, um, it may be more challenging to address the uh, the July 2022 bond payment. Um, uh, in in the same way that the January 22, 22 bond uh, payment should be able to be done, um, so yeah, I mean it would be uh, the intention. That is, uh, I think the the intention and the signaling impact of uh, the, the central bank saying that they are keen on uh, on uh, buying back the bonds. I think that would be taken quite positively uh, by markets, and I think already we've seen some shrinking of the um, of the spread on the January 22 uh, paper. Um, but there are kind of practical issues when it comes to actually um, implementing that kind of transaction as well. Um, another question that we've got regarding the um, downgrade, as we mentioned before as well. Um, since we were downgraded to uh, C because of the debt sustainability issue, is regaining access to capital markets or an upgrade in our ratings possible to face the issue of debt repayment? Yeah, so um, it is. It is. Uh, so yeah, there are there were several factors again that would have contributed to the uh, to the rating downgrade, right? So um, one of the biggest factors is of course Sri Lanka's the the weakening of Sri Lanka's fiscal position. Um, now in 2020, uh, like many other countries, Sri Lanka's budget widened um, quite significantly with the pandemic. Economic activity declined. Naturally, re naturally revenues come down as well. Spending requirements are also higher in uh, in, in in that context. So uh, the budget deficit widens across the board for for many countries. Sri Lanka was a little bit exceptional in for two reasons. Uh, one was just prior to the uh, pandemic striking, we also made policy decisions to reduce our uh, taxation, and that that brought down revenues uh, further than it would have otherwise come down with the pandemic. Um, and also, our starting quite weak as well, right? So in 2019, we start, we entered the pandemic with a, a budget deficit of 6.8%, um, which is a lot higher than the, the typical global global median or global mean uh, budget deficit. So starting at a 6.8 level and increasing it substantially from there um, puts us on a pretty tricky wicket when it comes to overall uh, the overall stability from fiscal perspective compared to other countries. Um, so that is what that is what would have been one of the key factors that um, the rating agencies would have taken into account. Um, and so, so again, in terms of getting getting out of that to re-rate ourselves uh, from triple C back up to a level of B and up from there, uh, again, that would also have to start from the fiscal side of things, right? We would have to start, you know, address the fiscal uh, the the fiscal deficit in particular. Um, uh, but the, the challenge is that look, Sri Lanka is coming out is still coming out of a um, of uh, of the pandemic and the the adverse economic impacts. As a result of the pandemic, so an immediate uh, fiscal tightening measure is also going to be uh, is also going to be uh, disruptive and negative, have a negative impact on uh, on the economy and in terms of debt, debt sustainability as well. Um, so that balance has to be struck quite carefully. Um, 
and there are ways to do this. So, for instance, with regard to uh, with regard to improving revenue, uh, there are certainly measures that can be taken on the revenue side that are not as disruptive to growth. So, particularly uh, measures that can improve the the tax base uh, instead of uh, necessarily raising rates immediately. I think rates rates can be can be adjusted gradually. Uh, but measures to to improve the tax base, tax administration, efficiency of tax collection, that can be done without you know having a major negative impact on economic activity, right? So, to take a couple of examples, measures like uh, pay as you earn tax, uh, the withholding tax on employment income, uh, withholding taxes on interest income, um, all of those can be reintroduced, which would immediately have a, a positive impact in terms of tax collection, but doesn't necessarily have a negative impact in terms of uh, in terms of affecting economic activity adversely. So I would expect that um, the budget would need to address that kind of uh, that kind of measure and spell out a very clear path in terms of how Sri Lanka addresses its fiscal uh, or improves its fiscal position in the medium term. Um, and that has to be a very credible, uh, a credible demonstration of how that uh, policy path is going to be mapped out. Uh, and that is what uh, um, rating agencies would need to take into account. Um, and that is a, would be a critical step in a, a critical first step in terms of uh, improving our uh, improving our credit ratings and then being able to access global capital markets again. I think we've received a, a interesting question here, uh, and, and I and I and I quote: "As I understand, reserves wouldn't be an issue under a floating exchange rate regime. What would happen if we were to transition to such an exchange rate?" would a recalibration of the exchange rate make more sense in the long run yeah uh good question um so it's it's like this i mean if we immediately go into a floating exchange regime we would have significant volatility uh, around that as well right so uh, typically when you have a, a shift from a, um, a sri lanka technically has a managed float we don't have a formal peg we even though it seems like we do at times um, going from a, uh, a managed float or a, a peg to a, a floating exchange rate can create significant volatility in the short term. Uh, typically, so typically that could have um, that could have adverse impacts in terms of uh, in terms of inflation and the price level. It could have adverse impacts in terms of uh, the cost of uh, the cost of raw materials and critical inputs as well. Right. So so there are certainly costs or or, or challenges associated with that kind of um, that kind of transition from a uh, from our current ex uh, exchange regime to a pure floating regime as well. Now, the in order to have um, uh, a, a, a credible peg, right, which which many countries have had, you also need to have the reserves, uh, the reserve stability, uh, the, the the reserve buffers to be able to defend to make that a credible peg, right. So you need to have the reserves to be able to uh, to to sell dollars, you know, when there is uh, depreciation pressure, uh, and the ability to buy dollars when. Um, uh, when there is uh, when there is appreciation pressure as well, uh, Sri Lanka's challenge is that we we don't really have that that reserve buffer. Um, so the, re the reserves that we have are required for our debt repayments and uh, all of our other dollar liabilities, um, and that makes it very difficult for the for the uh, for the monetary authorities to, to to convince markets that look, we we have this uh, we have this plank of 200, 203, and we will defend it. Markets know that we don't. Sri Lanka doesn't have the reserve power to be able to defend it consistently. So markets will simply uh, expect that, look, this will have to break at some point. The currency will have to depreciate. Uh, so exporters have a, a clear incentive. Exporters and other remittances have a clear incentive to not convert their uh, proceeds into rupees until that um, until that depreciation has taken place. Um, and importers also want to import uh, uh, more rapidly or more kind of stock up more quickly, expecting that future price cost of imports will be higher as well. So that is kind of the situation that Sri Lanka is in right now, right? So given this kind of uh, well, not so credible pick that we have, we have created an incentive for exporters and inflows to uh, to not convert. And we've created an incentive for importers to uh, to kind of stock up quickly as well. And that kind of makes the uh, that creates additional pressure uh, in the short term on the currency through the, the speculative uh, impacts or implications as well um, so that's kind of the, the the challenge around this shift from a um, uh, from a the pig system that we have to uh, a pure floating rate uh, in terms of exchange management Deshal, I think on the on the on the same topic of exchange rates, one of our viewers wants to know 
what is the implication of linking the rupee to the US dollar and whether it can be done uh, at this stage? So again, to do that, you need to have the, the reserve buffer, to, the buffers to be able to make that credible, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's exactly what I, what I just said. So if we don't have sufficient reserves to be able to convince markets that, you know, if the uh, rupee is depreciating, that the central bank will sell dollars and, uh, and keep the rupee uh, stable, uh, then you can uh, you can have a you can have a the, the, the rupee pegged to the dollar or any other any other instrument. Um, but if you simply don't have the reserve ammunition to do that, you don't you can't make a credible commitment to uh, to maintain uh, a stable exchange rate. Then you have eventually you do have to allow the the currency to float or to take a sharp depreciation to a to a higher level uh, to a to a more depreciated level than we are at uh, at present. Uh, and, and the market is, is well aware of it. These are cycles that Sri Lanka has gone through several times over over the years, right? So um, it's it's not something that is is uh, is brand new to us as well. We've seen it in, in I think 2015-16. We saw it in 2011-12. Uh, it's a, it's a fairly regular it's a it's a fairly regular occurrence. Um, this was to slightly veer off the conversation on exchange rates. Um, I was wondering if. Um, or if you could hear about your opinion on the present um, interest rate regime and what exactly is, has been happening over, over the time and then like, if you see any sectors particularly that are being affected or would be affected. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, again, when the pandemic hit and we started to see significant economic disruptions, uh, many countries, not just Sri Lanka, started to reduce interest rates quite dramatically, right? So there was a, a clear monetary stimulus that was provided uh, across the board globally, Sri Lanka uh, joined uh, joined that same um, that same bandwagon. Um, and in order to so at the same time we had a very high budget deficit as well, right? So in order to maintain low interest rates while having a budget deficit, it requires uh, it requires some degree of deficit financing, where the central bank will finance part of uh, the government's debt, building up the central bank's assets in terms of rupee holdings or in terms of the central bank's holdings of uh, treasury bills and bonds. Now, in during the uh, while the pandemic is is going on, when the economy is in recession, um, having that kind of uh, interest rate regime, having that kind of deficit financing to support a, a low interest rate regime, um, is it can be can be a, a stable and and uh, and short term sustainable uh, position to take. Once the economy starts recovering, once you start to see private economic activity, private demand for credit increasing as well, um, then it becomes necessary to. Uh, to phase out that deficit financing by the central bank, right? So, because if you have both private credit demand growing strongly along with government credit demand growing strongly as well, um, in, in when you have both this happening at the same time, then that's going to start creating, uh, triggering overheating. It's going to start triggering uh, either pressures in terms of inflation or pressures in terms of uh, balance of payments and the exchange rate. Uh, in, in Sri Lanka, typically, you start to see the exchange rate and the balance of payments pressures coming first inflation kicking in um, as a secondary uh, as a secondary factor um, and uh, what i think happened in sri lanka was that we probably delayed to some extent the um, the phasing out of the of the deficit financing um, once the economy started to recover uh, and that was where in the early part of the year we started to see the current account deficit widening quite uh, quite sharply input group took off uh, quite rapidly in the first uh, couple of months of this year, uh, and that started to put pressure on reserves. It started to put pressure on the on the currency as well. Now, what's been happening in the last say two months or so is has been the the central bank starting to uh, slowly roll back on that uh, on that deficit financing. Right, so they have gradually reduced the the level of uh, deficit financing, and the, they have allowed interest rates to increase um, uh, quite quite significantly as well in the last uh, couple of weeks. Um, so I think it's uh, it's it's a pr the, the 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 rollback of deficit financing, the the the, the tapering of uh, of deficit financing, as we call it. Uh, I think that is certainly a welcome move in terms of uh, overall macroeconomic management and macroeconomic uh, stability. Uh, at the same time, you don't want to allow interest rates to increase too sharply as well. That has to be a managed process so that you don't disrupt uh, economic activity in general. Right. So. Um, one of the one of the fact one of the key factors in terms of Sri Lanka's um, uh, in terms of Sri Lankan economic activity uh, is of course the 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 level of interest. When we have interest rates that are real interest rates that are too high, that also can uh, disrupt uh, disrupt the investment decision. It can disrupt uh, consumption as well. So when you're coming out of 
uh, a pandemic coming out of uh, significant economic challenges, that adjustment on interest rates has to be managed as well. Uh, and I think that was in the roadmap also that has been uh, that was addressed. The, the government didn't make specific reference to uh, tapering of uh, of deficit financing. I think that's a it's a positive signal. Uh, it's still going to be quite tricky to manage that in a way where interest rates don't increase too sharply, uh, particularly whilst your budget deficit is still quite high. So it's a it's a tricky adjustment, but I think the the, the recent signals have been have been quite positive in that direction. I think if we were to go back to our viewers, uh, I think there's an interesting question on debt. Uh, why is the government averse to debt restructuring, which appears to be the most obvious solution to the debt crisis? Uh, what are your thoughts, Desha? So yeah, Sri Lanka has never had to um, had to restructure its uh, its debt, right? So and and typically that is something that countries would want to avoid doing. Um, once you restructure your debt, your credit rating goes a notch below where we are right now. So we are triple C. Any country that restructures debt um, goes to what you call RD, restricted default, um, and that's a it's it's a it's fairly negative uh, negative signal in terms of global markets. It becomes difficult to to access global markets uh, again, at least in the, in the short term, uh, and it can have a fairly uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't say permanent but a somewhat more longer term impact on your overall cost of uh, uh, cost of borrowing in global markets in the future as well. So typically a, a country would try to avoid a restructuring of debt for as long as it uh, for as long as it possibly can. Um, uh, but at the same time in at, at a certain point when your uh, when your debt does come to a level that becomes difficult to manage from the liquidity perspective that is often the your the it is often the only option that you have as well um so sri lanka's government has taken the view that look we still have options that uh, that we can pursue before looking at a restructuring of debt um i would i think that the current view is that uh, the expectation that tourism inflows in the next few months uh, could provide some respite and and enable Sri Lanka to uh, to meet its uh, debt obligations in 2022 and beyond, um, along with some of the plans that have been outlined in terms of um, uh, divestment of uh, of government assets, uh, the government to government uh, borrowing uh, options. I, it looks like the government is still pursuing, trying to pursue those alternative measures for as far as possible uh, before they they consider a restructuring. Now, the other alternative to restructuring, which is uh, an outright default, where you uh, where you do not where you don't meet a debt obligation, either a, a coupon either a coupon payment or a uh, or a capital payment, uh, with prior to with, without negotiating with your creditors, that is an even worse outcome than uh, than a uh, than a restructuring. So restructuring would be a negotiated default, uh, um, an outright default would be a non negotiated default. The, the adverse long-term impact impacts of um, uh, outright default significantly outweigh the adverse effects of a restructuring. So it would be uh, three choices. So you, your first choice would be to avoid restructuring and, and, and find ways to uh, meet your debt repayments without that. If that is not possible, then the restructuring is an express solution. Uh, and the thing that you must avoid at, at any cost uh, is uh, an outright default, similar to what happened to Lebanon um, last year and what has happened to several countries over the years as well. Um, so ideally, of course, if we had taken measures to regain access to global capital markets to be able to roll over our uh, capital uh, capital repayments, um, we could have avoided uh, restructuring. But uh, the longer we wait, the more our reserve positions get squeezed and the options run out in terms of our uh, alternative inflows, it becomes increasingly difficult to uh, to uh, to kind of avoid that restructuring option, uh, but it looks like the government is still trying to see what else it can do uh, before taking that that path. I believe there is another question on the exchange rate. If I was just to simply uh, summarize. What the question is, I believe uh, the viewer wants to know uh, whether whether a, a more reasonable depreciation of the exchange rate result in uh, forex in inflows. And I think the second part of the question is, uh, he says the remittance inward may be shifting towards the Havala method. Uh, 
this gives 10 percent more does this imply uh, this implies isn't the exchange rate overvalued yeah good question um so yeah i think what we've seen in the last few months maybe since around june maybe since around may of this year is this this parallel exchange rates in the market right so you have the official rate at 200 203 um, and you have uh, transactions happening at uh, at unofficial rates at over 230 uh, rupees to the dollar um so clearly the market is uh, is expecting uh, uh, ex it has a has a has a view that the, the current uh, formal exchange rate is uh, is overvalued and there is and it, uh, that it needs to depreciate um and i think what happens is that when the when the market takes that view it can become self fulfilling uh, because what will happen is, as we as we discussed earlier, uh, the market will will avoid uh, converting at the official rate. Will hold back its conversions. Uh, importers will try to to fast track or front load those conversions, and that immediately uh, it, it it further exacerbates the 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 dollar liquidity situation, and that puts further pressure on on kind of uh, uh, of kind of cascading that depreciation faster than uh, than it would otherwise uh, happen so in the current context it's clear that there is uh, depreciation pressure in the market and there are fundamental drivers of that as well we do see uh, if you look at the current account we do see a, a significant gap between uh, the import uh, current import demand levels and uh, exports and remittances um, but that fundamental the, the divergence is further exacerbated by the speculatory pressure that we are seeing right now given the fact that we have these divergent rates so certainly if we do have some level of uh, depreciation of the currency it can reduce that speculation impact right so at that if you say if the rupee is uh, is official rate is increased to 225 then you could see more of those conversions coming in from exporters from uh, remittances uh, and it will then reduce the incentive for importers to fast to kind of front load the imports as well so that then can reduce that uh, reduce that pressure uh, that pressure to some extent i mean a good example of this is what's happened with remittances right so in the last few months we've seen remittances declining about 35 percent year on year uh, since around June um, 2020, 2021, compared to the the last three months of uh, the the same period in 2020, uh, and that is quite uh, quite typically because of this divergence between what you see in the official rate and what you see in the in the uh, informal markets. So certainly, a depreciation can uh, help reduce that speculation impact to some uh, to some extent. Um, Nishal, another question that we've got in is. Could mid-single-digit inflation lead to a contraction of aggregate demand, given that wages have contracted in the recent past? And finally, uh, part two to that question would be, and finally, leading to a recessionary state. Um, no, I don't think that that's a direct link uh, between the inflation being at mid-single-digit levels, right? So the, the problems start to happen if inflation starts going significantly above that and kind of getting out of control. Um, so typically, if you have inflation rates that go into double digit levels, go into, say, 20 percent, then that forces the government also to have uh, a sharp uh, response to that in terms of increasing interest rates uh, and other measures to kind of to counter uh, to counter that inflation. Um, and those measures then can then can create significant um, headwinds for growth. So Sri Lanka is. Um, uh, inflation still has remained at, at levels that are within the central bank's formal comfort levels, right? So the central bank stated uh, comfort range for inflation is between 4% and 6%. Uh, and our headline inflation, the CCPI, has remained within within those uh, within that range as well. What's also important to understand is that uh, uh, inflation in Sri Lanka, at least in, in, the, in the recent past, has not really been driven uh, that much by demand-driven inflation. Uh, a lot of the, the pressures for inflation have been uh, because of disruptions in the supply chain. Uh, we've seen global commodity prices increasing quite sharply uh, as well. Uh, the shortages that we've, we've seen in critical imports uh, have, been factored, uh, have impacted supply chains uh, in the economy. Uh, and it's, it appears that those, um, those supply-driven uh, inflation has been the, the, the greater contributor to inflation than demand-driven inflation. And we see that also, in fact, that core inflation is, um, is also at levels of um, around, at, at or around 4% um, right now. Typically, the central bank's policy response would be to demand-driven inflation than supply-driven inflation, unless it sees the supply-driven inflation leading to um, 
to to kind of uh, cascading into uh, into demand driven inflation as well. So in this context, I don't see the, mid, the inflation levels where they are triggering a, a, a sharp decline in growth or triggering a, a monetary policy action that that results in a sharp decline in growth. I think this level of inflation is still a level that is comfortable for the central bank within their stated policy range. But if inflation does go into double digit levels and, uh, and starts accelerating from there, uh, at that point, it would trigger uh, a, tight, a more sharp tightening of monetary policy, which would be inimical for economic growth in general. Um, thank you, Tasha. Uh, we have uh, one more question um, from the audience. It says, what are your thoughts on the suggested tax on 28% on for exporters if the earnings are not repatriated? Um, yeah, I think, the, I think what the... What the governor said was that it would they would recommend to the government or suggest to the government that if an exporter does not convert um, dollars fully or to the expect uh, to the extra extent that it's expected, um, that that should be they should be charged 28% as opposed to 24 the 14% that normal exporters are charged. Um, look, I, I, in general, I take the view that that taxation shouldn't be seen as a measure of either either an incentive or a or a or a punitive measure in terms of economic activity, right? Taxation should be seen as a measure of raising revenues that are required for to fund the government's expenditure and to manage the to manage budget deficits in a, in a in a reasonable level. I think one of the problems that Sri Lanka has faced over the years is that we've constantly used tax policy um, as kind of the you know, our go-to choice in terms of uh, in terms of trying to um, address some of the other fundamental problems in the economy. So, if, for instance, a, a sector is has challenges in terms of, say, electricity cost or uh, labor shortages. What Sri Lankan governments have done over several years, several decades, in fact, is give that sector a tax break. Um, and what we have seen over the years is that that has resulted in our revenue kind of eroding quite uh, quite significantly. Before 1996, Sri Lanka collected more than 20% um, uh, of GDP as, uh, as government revenue. Uh, Today, that's down to 9%, right? And that's one of the lowest levels in the world. And one of the factors, one of the reasons behind that is this, we are constantly using our tax policy to achieve other economic objectives. Um, and that is kind of, it, it's, I, I mean, I, I don't want to be harsh, but I would see that as a kind of lazy way to, to address some of the more difficult factors that you need to address. If a, if a sector has electricity, is, uh, is facing high costs from, uh, from electricity, we need to address our energy generation costs and the, and the kind of more fundamental drivers of that. If we have labor shortages, we need to address uh, labor shortages and the cost of labor. Uh, we can't address everything simply by you know, using taxes either as a punitive measure or, uh, um, or an, incentive, uh, an incentive for economic uh, activity. So yeah, I, I I don't think that's that's really the way to uh, address the problem that they're trying to solve. Ladies and gentlemen, we're still open for questions, so please do send in your questions. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I, uh, let me just uh, you know some uh, summarize a few other questions that have that have that have come our way. Uh, they shall. Uh, I I think uh, I'm I'm just summarizing a few uh, of, of of the comments from the comment section. Uh, that uh, now a lot of these issues that we are facing uh, are technically uh, at least you know long term <coughs> structural issues. Uh, you know that have grown over time. Uh, would you be able to tell us as to what sectors will be you know in in terms of achieving long term growth? What sectors do we need to focus on? Uh, and 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 I think uh, adding on to that question, is it possible to grow our way out of the debt? Uh, is 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 that a viable strategy? Yeah, um, yeah. So in terms of what sectors that we need to focus on, I would think that look, one of the problems that we have is we have these large external um, external liabilities uh, that have been maturing, and we have been. One of the one of the ways we've been trying to address that is by suppressing our outflows. Right, we've been trying to suppress imports. So we've been trying to you know find other ways of um, of trying to um, uh, trying to address these external liabilities that that we need to settle. Um, I think that the actual problem is that we we probably have don't have enough on in terms of inflows. Uh, 
Um, we we don't have enough in terms of our export earnings, in terms of uh, in terms of tourism, remittances, service imports, uh, service uh, exports. Uh, I would think the way to solve our structural, our kind of longer term external uh, balances, at least, is not by suppressing imports, but by um, but by trying to improve uh, our inflows. Uh, so towards that end, I would think that our growth focus should really be in terms of um, in encouraging uh, non debt creating inflows. Uh, so FDI again, something that came up in the roadmap um, uh, quite uh, quite significantly is going to be critical. But particularly FDI into sectors that generates further inflows. So export oriented FDI or FDI into say into export manufacturing, into export agriculture, uh, into export of services. So tourism is a services export, IT PPO is a services export, port sector, transportation, all of those are service exports, right? So um, those are the areas where we ought to be focusing our growth on. Um, what we've seen, so particularly if you look at Sri Lanka's immediate post-war growth, um, a lot of that growth was um, on was focused on the domestic sector, not creating, uh, not not uh, not growth that was creating uh, additional inflows in terms of say uh, in terms of forex inflows, right? So we haven't seen exports growing in a way that that probably we we ought to have been seeing or we should have been uh, we should have been seeing. So I would I would I wouldn't want to, to to like refer to say X Y and Z sectors, but in general I would think the growth that Sri Lanka needs is growth in terms of uh, non debt creating inflows, particularly into areas that uh, that create additional inflows through the through the form of exports of goods services uh, and so on. Uh, I think sorry you had a, you had a follow up question to that as well, no? Yes, yes. Uh, on the uh, the the growing out of debt issue, debt issue. Yes, exactly. Growing out of growing out of debt. Yeah, 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 yeah. So so look, I mean, it's, it's like this. So when you when you look at the uh, if you look at the country's debt, it is you look at uh, uh, debt as a percentage of GDP, right? So um, when your debt is growing faster than your GDP growth, then your your overall debt to GDP ratio is going to be increasing. Uh, in, a, in a in a rapid way, so you certainly cannot you cannot ignore your nominal GDP growth in the pursuit of of debt sustainability. So there are several several elements that need to be looked at in order to reduce your overall debt. You need to reduce your budget deficit, specifically your your primary deficit. You need to bring the primary deficit down. Um, you need to also manage the cost of your uh, the cost of your debt. Uh, be it in the form of interest rates or in the form of the uh, the exchange rate if you're foreign debt, uh, but at the same time you have to make sure that your um, uh, your your nominal GDP is growing in a manner, manner that exceeds the growth of your debt. That is the way that you can uh, you can bring down your uh, you can bring down your overall debt to GDP. So if you are in a situation where your your growth is uh, weak, then your primary your your primary surplus or your your primary deficit has to compensate for that weak growth. Whereas if your growth is strong, then the adjustment on the primary deficit can be um, uh, can be a little bit more uh, more flexible. So definitely, the nominal 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 GDP growth is a critical element in terms of debt sustainability. It cannot be it cannot be ignored. Uh, ideally, you want to strike a balance between your fiscal adjustment and your and your growth levels. Okay, can I have a follow up to a follow up to the follow up uh, that was that was. That was taken up. Is it all right? Um, sure, sure. Uh, so, so Deshal, I think uh, you know. Uh, I think that Vikram Institute has, has done a lot of research on SOEs. So, what 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 do you think should be the role of uh, SOE reform to, to to Sri Lanka's growth story? And do do you think that you know reforming SOEs might be uh, a possible strategy? Uh, to help us on, on especially on our on on the issue of debt on the issue of Im improving government revenue uh, what are your thoughts on that yeah no i mean absolutely so uh, soes have have been a significant um, <clears throat> a significant contributor to sri lanka's um, adverse fiscal position right so we have large soes that have been consistently uh, loss making for various reasons um, so certainly there is a there's a strong case to be made um, towards improving SOE uh, SOE profitability, or at least reducing SOE losses, uh, in order to reduce the fiscal burden that arises out of that, um, and also there are cascading effect impacts on the rest of the economy as well. Uh, so, for example, if you take uh, the Sri Petroleum Corporation, they have large debts that uh, that have accrued in, in US dollars, 
uh, and those debts are parked with uh, with the state banks. So if there is a, any kind of inability of uh, the CPC to honor under those debts, then that affects the entire banking system due to the fact that uh, the two state banks account for close to 40% of banking sector assets, right? So so there are there are significant ramifications of the, the financial health of SOEs for the rest of the macroeconomy. Uh, and that goes beyond the fiscal side. So, so definitely the fiscal issues in terms of the SOE's contribution to fiscal to fiscal debt, um, but also in terms of the overall uh, the overall macroeconomic stability that arises through the financial markets, uh, through the financial system as well through the banking sector. Also, uh, SOE's also have a fairly large footprint in terms of Sri Lanka's economy. I gave you one example in terms of the banking sector where uh, state banks control a, a significant part of overall banking sector assets. Um, but there are a number of other industries in the energy sector, for instance, in sectors like insurance, a number of sectors where the, the SOEs do have um, a significant footprint. So the, the efficiency, the competitiveness of SOEs, then of course, plays an important role in those overall sectors of the economy as well. So the, the message is that, look, SOEs do have uh, wide-ranging and cascading implications for the economy. Uh, and reforms towards improving their financial performance, improving their efficiency, uh, can certainly have a positive impact in terms of uh, Sri Lanka's overall fiscal and macroeconomic management. Uh, I believe we have a few more questions that have come up. Uh, Nakia, shall we take the one one on top? Uh, sure. The one on the GSP. Yeah. Um, so, Dishal, the, the, the question reads GSP plus on garment industry and its effect, uh, and how would it affect the Sri Lankan economy? Would it be badly? Yeah. So, uh, GSP certainly does have a positive impact. GSP plus has a positive impact in terms of the apparel sector in particular, but also sectors like uh, seafood and a number of other. Um, a uh, number of other kind of small exports into into the European Union. Now, given the importance of uh, the export sector uh, to Sri Lanka, uh, certainly having any any kind of uh, any kind of additional benefit that we can have is certainly going to be welcome. Um, that said, I don't think it's the end of the world when uh, when GSP does even GSP plus eventually does run out. It was anyway supposed to expire, I think, in 2023. I could be wrong on that. Um, and I think in in general, Sri Lanka, we, we do need to be able to compete. Uh, on our own, um, on our own steam at at some point, but certainly if measures like GSP Plus are available to us, we need to do everything that we can to keep uh, to 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 give that uh, advantage to our exporters, particularly in the situation where every um, every dollar that uh, we get as inflows is is critically important in terms of uh, in terms of our debt management and in terms of our macroeconomic management. So yeah, it is uh, it is a, a, a critical. Uh, a, a, a critical positive in the short term, um, but it's not something that you can rely on in the long term for your competitiveness. I think there's another interesting question on energy pricing. Uh, I think the viewer wants to know uh, with, with increasing fossil fuel prices across the world uh, and, and a need for additional uh, foreign exchange. Uh, the need for increasing the prices at the consumer's end is just being delayed due to the effect on inflation and 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 the flow through higher costs of living. Uh, Deshal, I think uh, the question is generally around increasing uh, uh, energy prices. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? And, and if I was to add on to that, I believe yesterday at the central bank uh, meeting, the governor uh, said that the, CP, uh, that the CBSL uh, has decided to provide uh, finance uh, to tackle the co country's energy bills. Uh, what, what what are your thoughts on that on that decision as well? How will it, how what will the kind of impact it will have on the role of the central bank and the economy? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, if you look at energy, it's I would break it down into two major areas. One is uh, the cost of um, or the energy required for transportation sector, which is primary. Uh, petroleum and diesel. And the second component would be the uh, requirement of energy for ele electricity generation, right? So if you take the first part of it in terms of transportation costs, definitely what we've seen is um, global fuel prices have increased quite uh, quite substantially compared to where they were in 
2020. So 2020, we got we got uh, a significant benefit by the fact that uh, Brent crude went down to about $35, $40 a barrel. Uh, today, Brent is maybe around uh, over seventy-five dollars a barrel, right? So, so certainly that increase in uh, in energy in the in the in the cost of petroleum certainly does have a significant impact in terms of Sri Lanka's um, a in terms of again CPC's financial performance, um, and also in terms of um, if those prices are passed on fully to uh, to the to the to the price of the pump, which typically it's not. Um, then again, that has cascading impacts on uh, on the overall uh, on overall price level in the, in the economy as well, um, and of course it is uh, it has important implications for the balance of payments. Uh, so the the fuel will typically account for around four billion dollars worth of uh, worth of imports. Sri Lanka's typical annual imports are around twenty billion dollars. So four billion is a is a fairly large uh, chunk of that uh, that also. So to to touch on the question that you referred to, Vimanga. Um, so what the central bank has said is that they will provide um, the foreign exchange required for the CPC to settle its um, its uh, uh, its its full bills as well, um, and that that is that that has to happen because typically uh, CPC would uh, uh, CPC's financing is provided by the two state banks BOC and uh, and People's Bank, and the central bank will need to provide uh, reserves uh, dollar support to to help those two banks to uh, to finance CPC debts as well. So that's I think important in terms of ensuring the <clears throat> the steady availability of um, of fuel to the economy, which Sri Lanka is a, as a net fuel importer, that is that is a critical uh, critical component of it. Um, on the electricity electricity side, um, this is an area that uh, Venture Research has certainly done a lot of uh, lot of work on. I would, uh, I would certainly recommend having a look at some of the publications that uh, that Venture has done. Um, and I think one of the one of the critical fact one of the critical factors in in Sri Lanka's energy uh, costs is our generation cost. Um, and there again, a lot can be done in terms of uh, in terms of management of uh, uh, of those costs, dispatch uh, dispatch costs, and so on. Uh, we often have situations where we are buying energy from uh, uh, either emergency suppliers or heavy fuel uh, suppliers, uh, and those costs can be extremely high compared to some of the other generation uh, that we have. So there is a lot that can, can be done to improve um, the management of energy generation and the pricing of energy generation. That can certainly influence the, uh, the, the overall cost of electricity at the household and at the commercial levels. Deshal, uh, I I think uh, to to you know as we move towards the con you know towards the end and towards the conclusion of our discussion, uh, something that we would like to ask you is, uh, you know I, I think we need to really re uh, you know focus on reforms to to to, to take things forward, uh, but as as someone who worked uh, and advised the former minister of finance during the Yahapal in the government, uh, you know wh what do you think uh, went you know. Uh, what do you think the government got fundamentally wrong when it comes to uh, the macroeconomy? Uh, and in retrospect, what can we learn uh, uh, learn from 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 what happened uh, from two thousand fifteen to two thousand nineteen? Yeah, great question. Um, so, look, I think what what was uh, so I, I worked at MOF in, at the Treasury between two thousand seventeen and two thousand nineteen, right? Um, so, uh, at that time. The, the kind of key priority was to try to uh, ensure stability to lead up to managing the debt repayments that were really building up from 2018, 19, and what we are what we are seeing today. Um, and in order to achieve that stability, a lot had to be done in terms of uh, in terms of um, uh, fiscal adjustment. So the, the 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 government took measures to improve government revenue, to manage expenditures, and in order to achieve um, uh, achieve a lower budget deficit. Um, and at the same time, there was also a lot of um, uh, monetary, uh, uh, there was fairly uh, uh, tight monetary management as well to make sure that we didn't have uh, inflation exceeding uh, target levels, to make sure that uh, the currency, um, that we didn't have too much uh, adverse pressure on the current account deficit and on the balance of payments also. So what we saw was that a lot of reforms that or kind of a lot of adjustment measures that needed to take place 
probably gradually over a long period of time. Uh, we saw a lot of that coming in together at the same time. So we had um, we had fairly uh, we had uh, significant fiscal adjustment, uh, significant um, monetary adjustment, uh, all coming in at uh, at the same time, which uh, which certainly uh, uh, would create some headwinds for for economic uh, activity as well. So in an ideal scenario, you'd want to phase those in gradually, right? You'd want to do those uh, gradually so that you don't. Uh, you don't have any disruptions in terms of uh, economic activity, um, but given the given the time constraints that uh, that the government faced in terms of managing these debt repayments that were coming up, it was essential that we maintained access to global uh, global capital markets uh, to and maintain our ratings so that we will uh, be able to uh, uh, to access markets and be able to uh, to refinance our debt. Um, so that was really the the that was really the the focus in ideal world. Uh, those reforms could have been sequenced uh, uh, in a kind of in a, in a more gradual and a more uh, more staggered manner. Um, of course, it was compounded by the fact that there were a lot of shocks to the economy as well. So, 2017, we had um, the the worst drought that the country had seen in 40 years. 2018, we had a, a constitutional crisis. 2019, uh, we had the East Sunda attacks. So, all of those factors kind of uh, made it very difficult. To achieve that twin objective of uh, of achieving some stability in on macro, macroeconomic management, whilst uh, whilst supporting uh, growth as well. So really, it would have been, I think, in terms of doing things different, those reforms should have started earlier. They should have ideally started in 2015 itself. It took some time for those to get uh, get going. 2017, it started towards the middle, the latter part of the political cycle, and that's never a good time to start your your reform process, right? You need to start that reform process much earlier. Um, so that kind of it backloaded is that the word yeah backloaded all of the a lot of the reforms uh, and that uh, that kind of um, made it quite difficult to manage in terms of getting the timing right with the with the, the with the debt management as well so yeah in terms of doing things differently start earlier sequence it uh, in a more in a more kind of smooth and, and gradual manner uh, that would be what i would have, uh, i would do differently thank you so much Dasha, for your very in depth um answers just um i feel like we're running out a little bit more of time just as a final conclusion to kind of sum up all the questions that we've been getting and kind of uh end uh, this session uh one final question um in just a few 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 lines so the actually like we've spoken a lot about the central bank's roadmap um and if it's sufficient to address the present crisis especially on on the debt management front um, and according to our analysis, what reforms can achieve macroeconomic uh, stabilization? As a summary for our audience, you could just touch on that. Yeah. So, so look, I mean, I think it it will all fundamentally come down come down to um, to improving our credit rating and regaining access to global capital markets. That is uh, fundamentally the only way that we can uh, we can come out of uh, the situation that we are in, right? So. Uh, relying on other measures such as you know, if you are if you are if you are relying on the the generosity or the willingness of other governments to to support us in this uh, in this situation, uh, we are relying on uh, uncertain uncertain inflows like divestment of uh, strategic uh, uh, assets um, or on um, uh, or on sectors like tourism, which can certainly can support but don't have the magnitude to be able to address all the problems. Um, I don't think any of those alternatives will really be sufficient to um, to address the, the 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 challenges that we face. The only way that we can uh, we can face those in a way that is within our control, within where we are masters of our own fate, is by regaining access to global capital markets, so that we can then refinance our debt and manage our interest payments and and carry on that way. To do that, you need to re-rate our credit ratings from the triple C levels back up to uh, levels of B and above. The first step towards that is, of course, in terms of uh, addressing the fiscal situation. So the budget this year is going to be critical um, in terms of uh, in terms of signaling that. Um, some of the adjustments that have been required on the monetary side have been started. I think the roadmap has uh, has been certainly positive in uh, in that sense in terms of signaling things like tapering off of deficit financing and gradual adjustment. Uh, in terms of rates, to be able to to manage the the macroeconomic side of things, um, so those 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 initial steps have been taken. That's positive. Uh, 
uh, but criti- I think our, our the KPI of uh, of the of the government should be how do we get our credit rating up from triple C to B so that we can regain access to global capital markets. I would think that is the almost the be all and end all of it in the short term. Thank you, Deshal, for, for, for an extensive analysis and for speaking uh, to our audience. I believe all of us lear- learned a lot uh, and, and, it, and, and it will help us uh, understand uh, as, as we move on uh, and, and experience and, you know, as, as, as the economy moves through the present crisis. So thank you very much, Deshal, for your prognosis, for your analysis uh, and, 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 and for your time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, a few, uh, if I was just to, uh, you know, uh, conclude uh, this evening session, uh, the Advocate Institute has also done uh, our own analysis and we've released a report titled The Framework for Economic Recovery. Uh, you can see it on our chat. So uh, if you're interested in uh, knowing what, what the Advocate Institute has proposed is in terms of reforms for macroeconomic stabilization, please do have a look uh, and and. and send us your comments and feedback. Uh, Nokia, are we, uh, are we forgetting anything or are we good to go? Um, I think I think that really sums it up. Thank you. Uh, so once again, Deshal, thank you very much. Uh, and also thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us this evening. Uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, the Advocate Institute will be hosting more live, live discussions like this in the future. So s- stay tuned on all our Advocata social media pages. Uh, have Have a wonderful evening, stay safe and take care.